are arriving almost at the end of the event, two days about talking about APIs. So we decided to have an, uh, as an ending keynote an, uh, an opening discussion, an opening discussion with, uh, with a keynote speaker, Mark Boyd, who uh, has been highly involved in the API days community and the API industry at all, and who will tell us the story about how APIs invented the blue collar space opera. Hello, Mark, how are you? Hey, Betty, how are you going? Congratulations yeah. on another awesome edition of API Days Interface. Yeah, uh, one more uh, or one less, we don't know, right? But uh, uh, but at least, yeah, we're almost like uh, 60 conferences uh, over the last 10 years. And oh. yes, you've been like uh, the walls. <laughs> you know, you've been there since the beginning. So yeah, it, it's really an honor to have you uh, ending the event. And actually with this title that is quite like uh, inspiring at the same time as a uh, in, in, in some intriguing, right? Like how APIs will invent the blue collar space opera. I'll let you um, uh, start and we'll have a, a discussion at the end. Fantastic. Talk to you afterwards. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to meet you all. Uh, my name's Mark Boyd. I'm the, uh, I use the pronouns he and him, and I'm the director at Platformable, where we measure the value that, a, that APIs are generating for open ecosystems in which all stakeholders can participate and co-create. I'm just gonna swap to my screen here um, and make sure you can see as I uh, flick through my slide deck. Um, so we've helped build API strategies for the European Commission. We've supported the World Bank with encouraging open APIs for financial inclusion. And just this week, we helped prepare some research on open health ecosystems for the World Health Organization. I'd like to thank my team for all their support, um, and together we build we build all of these uh, uh, the these view world well, views and the look into um, different open ecosystems together. As an Australian, when we present at meetings, we do acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on. But as this is an international conference, I'd like to pay my respects to Indigenous elders working to support their communities around the world today. Now, what an outstanding conference it's been. Congratulations, as I was saying to Mehdi and all of the API uh, IPI Days team and all of the speakers, but especially to all of you, the attendees. I've been fortunate enough to see some speaker presentations in amongst also moderating some roundtable sessions. And one of the best things um, about API Days is how engaged the community is and how so many of you jump in with questions and really get conversations going. I also love the theme of this year's interface event, all, uh, APIs all the way down. It makes me think about how central APIs are becoming, to, uh, are becoming to the digital economy because in the future, everything will be built on APIs. As Alyssa Knight said this morning, APIs are the fabric of the global economy. So whether that's REST or GraphQL or GRPC, which has been talked about a lot this um, weekend, um, oh, this last two days, or some new form of API, whether it uses async API or open API or another API specification standard, APIs will evolve, but the idea of modular components that can be connected together and new features added, the idea of distributed systems, uh, an architecture at scale that is enabled by APIs that connect systems and expose data and services. For us in the API world, it feels like it's everywhere and it's here to stay. But really, we, we are only at the start of this technological evolution. Last year, as the COVID pandemic really made us rethink our digital infrastructures, I think many of us realised how few existing enterprises or industry sectors were API ready. To this day, APIs aren't used nearly enough to share health data, for example, in a secure and trustworthy way between different systems. As I mentioned, we heard from Alyssa Knight uh, talking about the FHIR API standard this morning, but in a recent study we did with the World Health Organization, a lot of the data sharing, including for this platform for genome sequencing, which enables rapid detection of COVID variants, that data isn't being enabled by, via APIs as yet. In Europe, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control doesn't make use of APIs to draw in country data or make it available. That's 18 months into the pandemic and they're still offering once a day bulk downloads of the latest data. Except Finland, Finland does have APIs. 
A quick shout out here to Postman's COVID collection. It's amazing to see API tech companies jump in and think about what they can offer uh, for handling global crises. And kudos to Postman for making sure APIs was accessible and collected together so that API developers can quickly contribute to building solutions. There are other examples of API tech leadership, like the API-focused CRM uh, Salesforce, which was instrumental in allocating resources to move PPE supplies around in the early days in the, of the pandemic in the US. And Open Data Soft offered their API-enabled data platform for free to cities and agencies building COVID dashboards as well. And there are countless other uh, stories in the API sector. The, the pandemic made me think about us as a society, where we have come from and where we are headed. And I guess also because I had a lot of time at home to contemplate all this, during lockdown, I immersed myself in science fiction reading. So space opera is a genre of science fiction in which a ragtag group of adventurers stumble across some sort of giant threat. And so they have to work out together how to solve it. And in the last few years, a sub subgenre has emerged or emerged or disrupted the space opera called the blue collar space opera. So you see the space opera genre, when it started, it tended to be like a Flash Gordon or even Kirk, uh, Captain Kirk, star, Kirk type of storyline. Some rich white asshole who has the resources and the expensive ship and is allowed to go creep on alien spa species around the galaxy. But in recent years, writers like Charlie Jane Anders, Becky Chambers, Tim Pratt, John Scalzi, uh, I'm even going to say N.K. Jemison, whose latest work on cities we'll discuss in a minute, they've all flipped the genre. So it's much more about displaced, disenfranchised, independent workers or contractors, all traveling the galaxy and stumbling into huge chaos, cosmos ending threats that no one believes them about and they need to solve by stringing together whatever tech and wits they have about them. And that reminds me of APIs. Over the past 10 years, APIs have been hugely disruptive for industry monoliths and have, been, have allowed entry by new startups. APIs enable co-creation amongst stakeholders, allow people to generate the value they want. APIs can encourage autonomy and participation. You are not stuck with accepting an end product uh, that is what the manufacturer factorer wants to give you. You can take the parts and solve for what you need. And there is another story related to the blue collar space opera that reminds me of APIs. In 2019, Janet Ang won the prestigious John W. Campbell Award for Best New Science Fiction Writer, an award that comes from one of the early creators of the genre and is usually given to a writer who in some ways uses the space opera genre in their work. When Ang accepted the award, she spoke of Campbell's fascist and racist past, which in turn led to the renaming of the honour as the Astounding Award. Even this story reminds me of APIs. As Jeff Lawson spoke about at the start of the conference, developers and API leaders have a lot of power. If you look at the success of a lot of the global tech companies um, in the world today, um, in any sector, um, and if you look at how businesses have weathered the impacts of the pandemic, those that have done the best, they all depend on the API, on their API infrastructure. It's the API developers that are building and creating the successful businesses of the world. And developers themselves have the opportunity to disrupt and change the script, just as Aang did when she bravely accepted the award and set the science fiction community on the different path that acknowledged it's often misogynist and racist path. When I read my new blue collar space operas today, underneath the main storyline, I see the APIs all the way down. Let's look at a few of the concepts, concepts in recent novels. I highly recommend all of these titles for your summer reading. And let's see, will APIs get us to these Im imagined futures? Okay, concept number one, instant payments. In Tim Pratt's Axiom series and in Becky Chambers' uh, Wayfarer series, people often pay for things by moving money from their wristband to someone, other, uh, someone else's wristband and the credits are automatic, automatically exchanged. Are we there yet? Not really, not globally at least. So Venmo offers their API through the PayPal developer portal. Zelle offers an API in the US for businesses. Some payments providers like Agin that spoke earlier at API Days this week have integrations that build on instant payment systems, but many of these are credit card transaction processes. For businesses, there's still a way to access the funds. Uh, for peer-to-peer, -peer, it's more instant, but within country. 
So in Spain, I can send instant payments to other people in Spain. I can't send money instantly to someone in France. In Spain, there's Venmo, Zelle type services called Bizum. Uh, and look, here is their integration. So on the top here, you go to this page, you find the e-commerce platform you want to use. And then on the bottom left, you've got the documentation um, uh, list that you can download. And that's locked behind a zip PDF file that you need to register to see. So you can use Stripe, of course. It's ahead of the pack as usual and has been supporting small businesses. They also launched their climate service, which enables Stripe customers to allocate a percentage of their transactions to renewable energy savings, which API providers like geocoding specialists Open Cage do. But Stripe's instant payouts is at least the next business day. So while other bit payments, other payment services offer an API for instant payments notification. In other words, they inform you instantly when you have received a payment, not that the money is in your account. But there are a lot of moving parts still to fix for instant payments. There's anti-money laundering considerations that need to be solved, fraud assessment. Open banking related fraud isn't regularly reported. In fact, the number of API calls made through open banking systems globally or in any one country aren't reported on a regular basis. So there's a lot we can't see about how these APIs are enabling participation. Using today's APIs, we don't know if our ragtag group of adventurers could actually uh, just instantly pay to dock their spaceship so they can beat the aliens that are trying to destroy any civilization that reaches faster than light travel, because yes, that is one of the tropes of the genre. Okay, concept number two, government operations. So normally in blue collar space operas, the governments are massively complex planet spanning unions that ignore the little person. I love in Becky Chambers' series that shows how the official galactic government even drags their feet on helping a displaced species whose home planet was de destroyed by another alien species that's now part of the Union. It's too politically sensitive to help them resettle and enough time has passed without a solution that the government can just say that the species prefer prefers to live nomadically. In these novels, these governments turn up right when needed to deliver all of their services or insight or oversight instantly, digitally accessibly. So are we there yet? So two years ago, I was part of a team that wrote the API framework for digital governments for the European Commission. The team produced some great research on the state of government APIs and their potential, and we came up with an approach that ensured that APIs were policy-driven and focused on enabling citizen service delivery, optimising use of resources, and contributing to the reduction of inequalities. Since then, there's been some progress. France, Netherlands, and areas like the Lombardia region in northern Italy are all standout examples of government API infrastructures. UK, US, Singapore and Australia are also world leaders in implementing government APIs that enable joined up service delivery. But it's really only Singapore to, to date that is thinking about how to use APIs to totally turn our notion of government services on their head. In Singapore, they are looking at a citizen life journey that they call the moments of life process that looks at where APIs could intervene to make life, life, life less bureaucratic. For example, around the world, usually if you have a baby, then the hospital records the birth, but you have to go and apply for new family assistance or arrange vaccines and early childhood support services. When that baby grows into an adult and starts a business, they have to lodge taxes and so on. Singapore's Moments of Life approach looks at using APIs so that the government comes to you. When a birth is registered, an API triggers the family allowance, the vaccines, the early childhood services. And when starting a business, they could automatically be registered for the right tax systems and supported to maintain their account um, keeping automatically as, as services like Xero, which is presented here at API Days and QuickBooks, are now able to do in some parts of the world by integrating your account keeping, your bank account and your tax submissions so that you never have to worry about not getting a rebate you are owed or not filing the right information for your taxes. So we are getting there and there's some amazing examples that seek to leverage APIs to reach those who might not be traditional users of government services. 
In Australia, the tech and API community has been involved in Hack for Refugees events, uh, which seek to build solutions for newly arrived migrants that combine government and tech APIs to create new products and services, for example. By the way, I'm proud to announce that Platformable, along with the API-focused businesses like well, Web Help and the others represented here with the logos, um, we've all signed a pledge this week at Mobile World Congress in Flat Barcelona to reach out to migrant, refugee and LGBT communities as a priority in our future hiring practices, because seeking to collectively hire 10,000 new employees for marginalised communities over the next 10 years. Code for America does awesome work, and New York City has built a social services benefits API that allows agencies to integrate the API so that it's easier for anyone to check what services clients are eligible for at the community, state, um, community, city, state, and national levels. So there's that sort of joined up thinking, and it's done in a way that protects privacy and stops that fragmentation that stops people from getting the services they need. What, new, what I love about the New York City um, services eligibility API um, is it doesn't collect data on anyone who want, who checks what, uh, what services they're eligible for. So undocumented residents, for example, can find out what services they can use without Fear of being persecuted. Okay, concept number three, the city is an organism. <clears throat> in N.K. Jemison's latest book, okay, it's not set in space, but still a ragtag group of adventurers who are displaced by society and have to fight against a cosmic evil. And in Charlie Jane Anderson's books, there's often this idea of the city as a leaving, living, breathing organism in itself. So are we there yet? In a lot of ways, APIs are making this a reality already. A lot of cities have sensors on waste management bins, for example, so that waste collection can be optimised. The city itself knows when it needs to ablute. A lot of cities use Open 311 to automatically register city complaints like graffiti or potholes so that city maintenance requests can be allocated and respond and the citizen informed of the outcome. But automating a city like this, creating it as a living, breathing organ organism, if you like, if you like, you can still introduce or widen inequalities. So in Open 311, the whole system is triggered by a citizen making a request, and citizens in higher income neighbourhoods may be more inclined to do so. They have regular work where they can um, make a call or send an email during the day instead of uh, lower paid or hospitality jobs where people are on their feet all day and the last thing they feel like dealing with when they finish their shift is sending an email or making a call to the city offices. So if that happens, more asset maintenance calls are directed to the high-income neighbourhoods. So those neighbourhoods keep getting improved and lower-income neighbourhoods aren't supported as much. So here you can see the risk that APIs can play in, a, a, a play in actually widening inequalities and entrenching disadvantage. But APIs could also be part of the solution here. Instead of just being triggered by citizen complaints, city vehicles could be fitted with sensors so that when workers travel through all neighbourhoods, um, as they pass over potholes, they automatically send an alert to the Open 311 system. We can think about how to create self-regulating cities that are balanced and support everyone. This API-driven tech, tech that skews towards higher advantage citizens also happens in private business as well. And I do understand um, that businesses have to go after paying customers. But the way tech is set up, is being set up, often automatically locks out some sections of the population or privileges those that have higher level of resources already. Okay, final concept, underdogs for the win. What I love about Blue Collar Space Operas is that it isn't the dystopian battle royale fighting tribes trope of a lot of recent science fiction. Sure, the underdog may win in those scenarios, but they are often co-opted into the system or they still fall into an overarching political um, system of power imbalances. In Blue Collar Space Operas, our ragtag group often defeats the alien overlords or corrupts or corrupt into get into galactic uh, government uh, themselves, and and they get up to they get to make up their own rules going forward. They either become the government and reshape the rules to work for everyone, or they're given special rights to roam freely because humanity owes them an eternal debt. I can't mention which books use these solutions to avoid spoilers, but it's pretty common. So, are we there yet? 
I like to think APIs and API run businesses are the disruptors. Our industry has, has leveled the playing field and allowed new market entrants to gain a foothold and grow. And what's more, it is all of you who have built that success. When you look at today's biggest businesses, they've all been built because they have had teams of bright, dynamic API developers helping them win success. But are we taking a step back and asking, what are we building here? Many of us are familiar with the concept of Conway's law, which states that a business is struck, the way a business is structured will determine the way the software is built. But we seem to forget this when we, when we hold up the Bezos mandate, which argue, argued internally to Amazon that everything should be built with APIs. We've heard several speakers, even um, at, at this API days and others, other API days, discuss that set of 10 rules um, uh, for, in the Bezos man, mandate. But the 10th rule in that mandate is, or else you will be fired. And that really speaks to the Conway's law nature at Amazon. I'm concerned about the monopoly and power that the, we as the API industry are feeding into Amazon, and I don't have an easy answer. I use services that are built on Amazon. Airtable, for example, uh, is one. And sure, they may have been the upstart, uh, upstart, but now they're the bully. They don't pay fair taxes. They don't treat black and brown workers in their warehouses fairly or provide a safe workspace. If we look at what they did in retail, they offered a small business as a platform. And then when, when they had a virtual monopoly, they changed the pricing agreements and started selling directly competitive product, products, which they had learned consumers wanted by studying the data from the sales volumes of those small retailers. Everyone who, who is building on AWS today can see that this is the future that is coming for you. Like I say, I don't have a solution. My, my business tries to decentralize where I can. I use Strapi um, as a backend because I, I can choose DigitalOcean as my backend server, whereas other headless CMS options would force me to build on AWS. But then I use Netlify for the front end, which is built on AWS. I've asked via their support if they can offer some options, but that, there aren't many that I know of. Um, collectively, as an industry, I feel like we are throwing out um, the lessons of vendor lock-in that we should have learned. And we're collectively shrugging and all going with Amazon. And eventually this will destroy us when they do the same to us that they did with retailers, what they do with their warehouse workers, what they do to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. And here's the crazy thing. The API industry, us individually, we have a lot of power. Again, I go back to how this conference started with Jeff Lawson. Ask your developer because developers know how to build success. So here's a small challenge I leave you all with. Consider, involve, decentralize. Consider the impacts of your tech and what you are building. Conduct impact assessments to see whether your tech has the potential to widen inequality or lock out some sectors of the community. We're seeing a rollback of facial recognition APIs at the moment because no one had did this upfront or had this upfront discussion about the potential implications. All tech has the potential to solve or to create harms, uh, knowing which direction your solution is facing. Like how our Open 311 example, any potential areas that widen in, uh, in inequality, APIs could also be used as part of the solution that rebalances those potential impacts if designed thoughtfully. Involve all target segments. API providers like Algolia and Twilio have great programs that they've been they've built up to ensure that their APIs can be used by startups and nonprofits that would otherwise have difficulty accessing and participating in the digital economy. If you're a developer evangelist, consider trying to measure the businesses that are using your APIs. How many of those businesses are women owned? migrant owned, LGBT owned. Crunch, Crunchbase has started uh, including data on diversity of management teams. AP, uh, unfortunately, most other global company information APIs don't record that um, data set as yet, but it's an essential data set if we are to measure whether open API ecosystems in banking, finance, insurance, energy, telcos, health, and so on, are enabling participation by everyone. And decentralized. Have a look at Jeremiah Lee's excellent Twitter series on coming off the white supremacists supporting Facebook, which is a good example of how to disentangle from larger platforms. 
Unfortunately, YouTube is pretty much a monopoly, even though they create obstacles for black and LGBT creators to monetize on their platform, yet make it easier for white racists to build audiences. Think about other options other than AWS when considering your API server architecture. How dependent are you on one or two players? And if they suddenly change their terms of service or pricing strategies, um, how vulnerable does this make you? How, can we, how much can we turn a blind eye to their sta staffing practices that don't allow toilet breaks for delivery drivers? You can decentralize all the way down. Every one of my blue collar space operas I bought uh, online through bookshop.org and the bookshop depository. Yes, they did take longer to get to me. Um, I know, I, but I'm willing to compromise on overnight delivery. You don't need to boycott necessarily, but recognize your power and make a few decisions to open up the playing field and diversify where your money goes and which businesses you support. So diversify and decentralize your tech stack. Post COVID, let's imagine a better world that doesn't use APIs to replicate the entrenched power systems of old. Let's imagine those exciting space opera scenarios. Let's get out of bed each morning and ask, as API developers, as API leaders, what kind of future do I really want to build today? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's it's a great ending for for the event. You know, like a great warning. You know, it's I think it's the Alan Kay quote, like uh, the only way to predict the future is to invent it. And yeah, and some people are inventing the future they want in with the design they want. And and it's funny enough, I, I wrote an article about like designing APIs is designing the future of our digital economy, right? You know, so I totally I totally uh, uh, understand. So uh, a quick question, did you see the news that maybe some people may have been fired by a bot? Right, no, yeah. well, I'm not surprised, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, the, the joke say that sometimes maybe a bot ha will ha would have more feelings than some managers, but that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the joke that people are saying about that. But yeah, it's true that at some point we are designing programmable interactions that have our biases inside. Exactly. And I mean, it's already happening with algorithms that are deciding on who gets financing um, uh, for, you know, small business financing, for example. And that's being built on the historical data that we had in um, systems that also were disadvantaged women owned businesses, migrant owned businesses. But the problem is with APIs, it's about speed of velocity. So these, when we introduce APIs to be able to replicate those those older systems and we're disrupting and providing a new world of um, instant um, decision making. The problem is that, that that's locking people out and then entrenching that at a much faster rate than it was done when it was humans doing those crazy things. Yeah, it's so, programmable, programmable biases. Right, right, at, 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 at pace, you yeah, know. At pace like, and at scale. And uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we're a little bit over time. And just maybe one, sure. one more question. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, the humans behind interfaces, right, that we don't see. And actually, you know, the shipping container in the logistics has enabled globalization, but also we don't know what happens before it's in the container, right? We don't see child labor. We don't see poor, poor working conditions because when you open the container, you don't see the supply chain before. So with APIs, it seems it's, it seems it's the same. You only see the interface. You don't see what's hap what happens behind the interface, the me mechanical Turks, for example, you know, yeah. or stuff like that. So yeah. So how we can put more, uh, I want to say, ethics or uh, moral into into uh, programmable interactions? I think I think I think that's right. I think the work that you've been doing on creating green ops, for example, it's the same. We do ethics ops. Like I think hopefully COVID has shown us that there are entrenched inequalities. And tech can tech, like I say, tech can actually enable solutions, but it can also entrench it cause harms. So we, I think what's happening is we get so caught up in the excitement of what we can build, we don't stop and just do a brainstorm of what the negative impacts could be. And it doesn't mean we stop building the tech. If we can see like the Open 311, there's the potential for it to go in that direction. We can actually build in ways that prevent that from going at pace, at, at velocity in that direction and instead um, uh, contribute to a social good as well. You know, and I, I think 
I think the API sector, I think we're ready for uh, living up to that opportunity. We've seen how much uh, potential power and influence we can have over the businesses of the future. So that's what I'm, you know, rallying everyone behind. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was reading one tweet earlier. I, I forgot the name of the of the lady who was saying it, but it say if harm and wars and and pain can have long term, uh, you know, effects, why we don't invest in you know in 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 hope, in faith, in care, who also have long effects, right? Well, let's let's have the opposite side and invest in the long effect of the the, the good parts, not the the bad parts. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you. I think your this talk deserves more time, <laughs> but maybe no, exactly. in another EPAD conference. Uh, yeah, it was great to to have you. And uh, uh, yes, I will ask um, everybody. I will thank everybody about the event, the two days, the team, uh, Baptiste, uh, Denise, uh, Ori, Ivan, uh, Aileen, and all the other Cecile and all the other people who have been involved, Aquela, and all the people who have been involved in the organization. That was two intense days of uh, talking about APIs. The theme of the event was it's API all the way down, but it's also you, humans all the way down behind these APIs and behind this API conference, uh, API's conference. So uh, this event will be uh, accessible after as replay. It's uh, delivered in three different time zones. And again, we invite you to go to api.global and you will be able to see all the events that we have, uh, all the initiative that we have, the Women in APIs, the Sustainable Digital Challenge, uh, and um, and, uh, and 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 yes, I think that's uh, 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 that's it. And API seen the media platform.